Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, great to see you. Great. So we're just uh, getting into the group now. I just want to make sure that um, give people a chance to come in. And this is just going to be such a great chat, Robin, because we've been chatting <laughs> a little bit off air already. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to this 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 hour is going to fly by. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, Happy New Year to you all as well. Um, oh, we're just going to get into this minute. Oh, give me a minute. That's it. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. This is our first um, Facebook Live of the New Year. So welcome, Robin. I've had a lot of interest um, for this. So I'm just going to wait. Oh, yeah, people are coming in the room now. Great. Yeah. Uh, if you want to say hi, people say hi, and I'll try and do some highs back as I see you uh, come in, come into the room. Um, good. So, did you have a nice time over? Oh, okay. Hi, Kim. Hi, Catherine. Did you have a nice time over the holidays, Robin? We had an interesting time over the holidays. We had a lot of cold weather, and you might have heard of the, the big winter storm that hit Canada. Yeah. And so, while it was minus thirty, uh, my daughter Mandy and her husband, who we they they built us a house on our farm, so they came into our house. So we kind of share a farm, but uh, they do a lot of the work, but they had to go away and they got stuck in Vancouver. And so we were extra three days. But other than that, we were lucky. We didn't have any, you know, damage, but it was, uh, it was cold and interesting, but nice to be home. Yeah, and uh, Samaria's had it quite bad. We, we had a bit of it here, over here in the UK, but not, not in the same kind of way. But I, I'm glad you uh, were able to kind of manage through that. And um, and still manage to enjoy some of the holidays as well. So that's important. Um, right, so hi, everybody's coming to the group nicely there. Oh, Lauren, Lauren McCall. Yeah, I think you know Lauren. Um, of course I know Lauren, yeah. Yeah, hi, so she, she's, hi. A, she's a neighbour now, Robin. How cool is that? I know, she's, I know, it's so exciting. Me. Yeah. So before Christmas, we went on the magical kind of um, Christmas steam train locally with... Uh, with Lauren and Helen and, and my husband and I, and we had a great time. Uh, so uh, yeah, hi everybody, everybody's coming in now, great. Okay, good. Robin, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. And uh, we've got a lot of I want to talk. So it's interesting for me, you know, we're, we're gonna have a little, little time just to kind of hear some of your kind of origin story, if you like. But um, I always start off asking these questions because I think it's always interesting to find out where people's inspiration comes from, what their journey is, because we all have, Whilst we all end up in a kind of a roughly the same destination, hence the group, we all have our own different routes through. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is how many people that have come in to talk in the group have identified yourself and Linda, uh, Linda Tellington, your sister, Tellington Jess. And, um, and I, only re I only learned that myself recently, Robin, that you and Linda <laughs> were sisters. Uh, and uh, and T-Touch, and they reference you two and T-Touch as being part of that that kind of aha moment, that kind of uh, realization that uh, that there is something there. That uh, so, uh, and I think it's important for us all to remember. Whilst there's been some traction in recent times, especially since uh, the last couple of years, since Dog Center Care has been up, on thinking more about the emotionality of the animals and the individual experience. This isn't a new conversation, and uh, and Li and Linda, especially like you said uh, when we were off air, is good 20 years has, has always been a good 20 years ahead of the curve on things and so uh, I think it's always good for us to kind of remember that you know this isn't a new thing as such but it is new and as far as it's getting more prominence I think which is about time right Robin so let's start off with those early days then Robin tell me how you was it was it Linda that started to connect some dots initially and you were there with her or were you a part of that joining the dots with with her how, how did it look in those early so, days yeah so in in uh I when I was Linda's the oldest of six and I'm the second youngest and so I mean Linda like turned 85 this year and you she's just uh, amazing she's really really incredible and uh so early days I was really into horses and when I was a child I would go to she lived in California and I went down to her school her she had an instructor school and I went there every summer so I spent my summers there and then kind of drifted off I you know kind of figured out um well I ended, actually I ended up teaching at her school and and so on actually I forget it you know I'm old and all these things that have happened um in so we had this instructor school and in the early 70s linda got really tired i was working with her with a tr more traditional but still a kinder way of working with horses and she got tired of things that people did to horses to win ribbons and she had been involved with 
pretty much all aspect of the horse world, endurance riding, hunter, jumper, um, it, almost everything to do with horses. And so she heard about this training that was going to start with Moshe Feldenkrais, and she decided she wanted to just change what she was doing. And she started this four-year program. And she said that the first week of the course changed her, this was in the early 70s, changed her experience and her thoughts about horses. And he made the statement that the nervous system has the possibility to learn in one lesson if there's no pain involved, if it's not a threat to the body, and if it's done through non-habitual movement. And she said, lying on the floor, her ears perked up like she was a horse and she thought, wow, I wonder, she goes, if that is true for people, maybe it's true for horses. And of course, in the horse world and kind of in the dog world, we kind of do this repetition thing that people do with training and you know, over and over and that's how they learn. So she went out to a, a friend of hers horses who was a broodmare that wasn't very friendly and was kind of hard to catch and didn't like people much. Took, they caught the horse, took her in the stall and did some like, you know, moved her ears because then they thought, what can I do that's non-habitual? Because it's only through doing non-habitual things that we get the attention of the nervous system. You know, habits bypass the thinking part of our brain. And so habits are useful, but you can't make a change unless you change something. And so anyway, this horse was like, they kind of stood back and watched it. They didn't see anything. And then the next day, the person called her and said, you know, I don't know what you did, but today my horse was at the gate waiting for me. And we, she went in the stall and she, instead of diving into her oats, she stood and looked at me like, well, are you going to do something? That was Linda's first thought that there was something that could be done. And so she, there, there's a, you know, a huge story that goes with that sort of the progression of that. But in 1980, 80, I guess, or 79, I went to Equitana with her in Germany and she's been going to Equitana, which is the largest horse trade show in the world since it started. And um, I was watching her do these things. She was implementing and trying these things that she learned in Feldenkrais. And I, I saw these horses really relax. And then I saw their movement change. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. So in 82, I, uh, I think it was in 82, while I was pregnant with my first child, I went down to the school that she had going at that point. And then I started doing a newsletter about it. And I started um, bringing her up for clinics and, you know, kind of went from there. And I mean, in, in, in 2025, it'll actually be 50 years since this, the concept of this target, <laughs> which wow. is like yeah. a long time. Yeah. So for 30 years, I put out a newsletter four to six times a year, stopped doing that a while ago, which I can't say I really miss. And um, so I, I just started with that and I'd watch her work and, we always would joke and say, Linda's the show horse and I'm the workhorse. And that wasn't meant in any disrespectful way at all. Linda is this intuitive sort of person who doesn't always know what she's doing. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just that she doesn't always know what she's doing that's making the difference. So I was kind of that person that would, being her sister, I was the only one. And of course, the one she, who named me, she came home and I'm the fifth kid born. And she goes, you have to name this one Robin with the last name Hood, right? And, uh, and we have, my mother's name was Marianne. So we made Mary and I have a brother named John. So it sort of wow. came, it kind of came from there. Yeah. And um, so it was, um, you know, I, I just kind of became involved. And, and then I started, I was, I started, teaching weekends and going out and it was mostly with dogs and or, um, horses until the sort of early 90s I think we started just experimenting to see well could you, this work on a dog could this work on you know what other animals and we sort of experimenting with that so I I was kind of just born into it you know what I mean it's not like it's something and because I was her sister I could sort of say, you know, Linda, I think actually when you think you're doing this, it might be that you're doing that this thing that you're doing is making a difference. So I was sort of those, I was the one who, Linda will say this, is I was the one that kind of made it into a, um, not didn't make it into a method, but just help to sort some of the things out and make it a little bit more consistent. 
So you were the Watson to her Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> there you really, go. That's you? good. Yeah. yeah. Because um, <clears throat> and sometimes we need that. I think when people are really, <laughs> you know, it's, it's clear for what you're saying there that from an early, especially when Linda herself had that kind of epiphany, that she was very connected to this notion that somehow, um, you know, that lived <laughs> experience for that animal uh, was better if that system was more in balance and um, you know, all the kind of different things that kind of come about to, to mean the nervous system is, is in that more dysregulated state or whatever comes along. Uh, and, I, and I can imagine her getting really lost into that or the, potentially she could get very lost into that kind of rabbit hole. And I think having sister there to kind of help to kind of keep that on a, on a, um, uh, on, on a path to kind of connecting things would have been really helpful. So that's a really interesting side of it. And, and when we think about starting off with horses, like we discussed off air, you know, the horse world is more generally even more behind than the dog world really. And in, in as far as people's perceived understanding of what horses are and what they need. So going back right back then, that, the, these kind of discussions that were coming out from, from Linda and yourself, how were they received within the horse community? Um, were there people who did, did people, were there some people in that community who were like, yeah, do you know, I see that too? Or were there some people just really putting up some barriers and blocks to what you're trying to put across? Well, I think it depended. I mean, Linda, even before this had been in her first husband, they had a research farm in California and they did a lot of research on rear facing trailers, on the use of kelp and everyday wormer. Um, they, they did a lot of research in the 60s that was, they wrote the first book, um, Physical Therapy for the Athletic Horse in 1963. So that was a long time ago. So they'd always been looking at things and they, interesting because in the horse world, see, they used to write an article for Western Horsemen. It's a very Western based magazine in the United States. And they had a column and they called it Let's Go. And it was a little bit about endurance and, and riding and so on. And they wrote an article that said, um, you know, you, it's possible to start young horses without them bucking, which is how we started young horses without any bucking. And they're like, they canceled the column because it was against their principles. <laughs> so that's even kind of earlier than that. And so I would say that, that it was, um, was kind of mixed. It, I would, in Germany, Linda did a lot of work in Germany and she did the first in 1992 or 80 something anyway, she did this study because Ursula Bruns, who is a prolific horse writer or she was, she's died, but she had a, she was very, very ahead of her time in terms of horse care and so on in the, in Germany, really shook things up for the Germans. And she said, Linda, this is nice that you can do this but can you teach it to other people? And if you can't teach it to other people, it doesn't matter. You know, so what? There's lots of good people out there with animals. And so they took, uh, they took 20 horses that were considered kind of not usable and eight amateur owners. And they took four to six weeks and they just went through the groundwork. Cause that's the other thing that people misunderstand about this work. They think it's only body work, but it's the movement work that really helps to solidify and change habitual patterns. And, and that's where the, just like with people. Mm. And, and so this, in, in uh, this four to six week course that she did, 18 of the 20 horses within three weeks were completely okay for amateurs to ride and handle and so on. And there were two that needed more body work. So what they did is a little bit of the T-touch, which didn't really have a name, um, and some very mindful groundwork. And that's, you know, slow, mindful movement in a variety of ways, which is what the Feldenkrais awareness through movement does to the humans. And from there, that's where it kind of, then it started to grow in Germany. And the thing about the Germans is that when they see something that really works, they, many of them will just go, wow, yes, I, I, I kind of, I've got that. So she's worked with some really top, top Olympic riders and trainers in Germany, and they, you know, really um, like the work. Of course, you know, not everybody is going to like what everybody does, because as we were talking about, A, there's lots of ways that work, and everybody has to find a way that is, resonates with them, that's okay for them, that they're comfortable with, and, um, that they if, if something's working for you why would you change it you know <clears throat> do you think it was a help that um 
from what you're saying there, the kind of message to the horse community then wasn't look, this is how you should train horses differently. Because if it would have been, there would have been more, well, hang on, I train the way I train. Because a lot of this stuff was actually, before you think about doing more, have a go at doing this to see what to see what um, state the horse is in then at the end of that, to be open to doing what you want to do. So I, is that kind of how it was kind of shown to people as a, as a precursor to doing other things, uh, to maybe try and get them to kind of look at it and, and, and give it the time? Well, you see, at the time, there were not very many clinicians going around doing workshops. So we used to do huge, like 100, 200 people, like just weekend kind of demos. And so people would bring their problem horses to us. And mm -hmm. that was kind of the, the start with it. So we would, you know, work with them and work with them and look to see, work with the horses and the humans to see what could be done. And sometimes people would bring us horses that were like really, really difficult to see just, just, you know, show me a kind of, you know, sort of attitude. And it, it was kind of fun. Some of the, some of the changes that happened with, with, with horses were, were fun, but here's the thing. I've done this for like 40, 40 years. And I'm, I know that there'll be a change and I'm still surprised when it works. And I love that. Mm. I, I, because when, you know, we talked a little bit about this, it's like, if you think you have the answer, it, who has all the answers and and there's always changes and it's just about having more tools and it's about having possibility and this is one of Moshe's sayings his intention was to make the impossible possible the possible easy and the easy elegant and if you start at that as your premise is you know one step of a dog walking in balance means that they can get two steps and 10 steps and 20 steps but it's just mm -hmm. that kind of first step so it's making the impossible possible um, as the starting point so there were lots of I would say of course there's lots of people that because they feel threatened if what you say to them is different from what they do you know nobody wants to think that they're doing something necessarily harmful and uh, you know so it's uh, it's the same in the dog, the dog world big time it's true. And, uh, and as we've said many times in the group, uh, perception is everything. So depending on what lens somebody's looking through. Yeah. And I think especially if you see the behavior as the thing that has to be addressed, uh, you're less likely to think about other things that might be aggravating factors that are causing that behavior. And I think especially, you know, what you've talked about there with these horses who come along on these programs mm -hmm. and, and they're, they are very different. Um, uh, it's a, it just shows that if the animal feels differently, they'll act differently. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple premise. And uh, it is. so let's just go into a little bit more on T-Touch, I think, um, uh, itself. So uh, for you then, Robin, I know we've only got a short amount of time here, I know. Uh, but in essence, what is it that you think is happening regarding T-Touch? Let's just think about, for example, the groundwork. What is it, what is that for those who don't know necessarily what that is, just very simply, and then what is it that you feel is potentially happening within the horse through that groundwork? So first of all, in terms of behavior, what we've always said is that behavior is a form of communication. You know, behavior is, is, a, is a, a cry for trying to figure something out. And in the, you know, from the very beginning in the early nineties, Linda made a statement and she said, that she believed that 90% of the time when horses or dogs, whatever, misbehave or did, didn't do what we wanted, it was because of fear, pain, or fear of pain. And if we, if we think about that, of course, at the time, you know, if it, you, we know we can just make animals and humans do things. So I think that what happens with the groundwork, it's, it's a little bit like with, with humans. If you go to a physiotherapist or you go to a chiropractor and you have a particular posture that is uh, exasperating some issue that you're having, and they may send you home with some exercises to do, but no one does them, right? Because we just keep going back to getting kind of fixed, if you will, and then we feel good and then we don't. And so the idea with the groundwork, and it really came like Linda's partner at the time, Roger Russell, who's now like one of the top Feldenkrais practitioners in Germany, he wasn't a horse person at all, but he was in the training with Linda, the Feldenkrais training. And he said, 
let's see what we can do to develop movement in horses that would be unfamiliar. So if slow movement builds muscle at a different level than fast movement does, and it's a more organized way of actually doing things. So thing, the labyrinth was kind of the hallmark of what we do. So we have what we call the playground of higher learning. And it can be all sorts of things. The, the labyrinth and various, it can be a circular labyrinth, it can be a square labyrinth. Um, there's a, we, you can add surfaces, you can add poles, you can add cones, all sorts of things to um, whatever you happen to have around. And what we notice is that when you take the animals through them slowly, and it's not a forced slowness, it's like, can they come into balance and kind of go through it, that there is a change that happens in their behavior and also in, uh, in even in, in their movement. You can really see a difference in their movement. And so it's not something that you have to keep doing over and over and over again. So it's because if you can help to change one habit for one that's more functional, it's again, it's not that habits are bad. It's just that you have to do something different in order to change a habit. And so you know, it's you can use a lot of things and you can have things that I, I, I thought about years and years ago, we had somebody in California, a, a student, and she took kind of made this playground and she took it to a park and there were all these people with dogs and she she charged them five dollars and she said, um, all right, so I want you to take your dog through this little pattern three times. Now, you can't force your dog to do anything. You have to just take them. And of course, people are like, you know, how competitive people are. Well, my dog should be able to do this or not. So that was so interesting, she said, because the first time, you know, some of them were a little bit hesitant and so on. By the third time, the relationship of the person and their dog was different. And there was so much more thought that went into what they were doing. And I, I thought that was such a fun story to be able to, you know, offer people something. And that's what I see that, you know, even some of the <clears throat> ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, various kinds of nose work and uh, whether it's free work or just the kind of whole canine nose thing is, I've always said it's something that dogs would sign up for. Now, can't we make things, things that dogs would sign up for that can also help really build a relationship with their person? And that last bit is really important, isn't it? Because I think, <clears throat> um, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Sarah Fisher and uh, I got introduced to a lot of this stuff through Sarah and, and up at yeah. Tea Farm and, uh, and meeting the amazing Annie Biggie, uh, who is who's over uh, doing uh, some uh, co-education with Sarah. And uh, a lot of the time, uh, my, my big bias is, is, is cognition, really, and processing, because that's just my bag. And I saw that with what I was seeing there, because I was thinking, this is great, because we're kind of slowing down and we're actually inviting the caregivers to be present. Mm. and to connect and as you say a lot of those things a lot of that they might come into that with their competitiveness and their kind of need for compliance and obedience that but this the the nature of these exercises means you you have to funnel away from that and and that funnel only takes you to connection which is really quite powerful isn't it i think oh yeah yeah, yeah. it really is well you know the greeks used to say about the labyrinth is that you would go in with a question and come out with an answer which I thought is really interesting. And, and again, years ago, we had a, a, someone, it was at one of the classes at Tilly Farm and uh, she was a, did behavioral consultations. And she said she used the labyrinth to help her, he, the human and the dog have a relationship. Cause she'd say she'd see people that would go into it without any really communication or, and then they'd come out on the other end and they had a really different um, level of connection and, and communication, which is what we all want, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's, and it is what we all want. And I think this is the powerful thing about this message. And this is why I think it's very important, not just the one that comes from T-Touch, but the wider message that we, we talk mm. about now about moving beyond the usual operant kind of toolkits and the usual notion of obedience and compliance. I think the general public have almost been sold this notion of kind of task at all costs, uh, but actually they deeply care for their animal and they, they almost need, permission or an invitation to think wow actually I can do loads just by being more present for my my animal and, and being more aware of their care and support needs absolutely and you know made me think about too again going back to the horse world <clears throat> you know it 
I, I've had so many people say that coming back to T-Touch allowed them to be with their animals the, the way they wanted to be as a child, but they were told they were too soft. Mm. And they, you just have to kind of make them do it. You have, and you know, it's, it's interesting because I, you know, I talk about um, horses a lot because that's I've ridden since before I could walk, and I've always had horses in my life. And I actually didn't have a dog in my life until fifty some years ago, which is a long time. But I didn't have dogs when we lived in the city because my mother said it wasn't fair to have a dog in the city because she we we'd had dogs when we lived on the farm and she felt that uh, we could have cats, but she didn't want us to, maybe she had too many kids and we wouldn't walk the dog and so on, but she really felt that dogs needed more freedom. And I'm lucky enough to live on a farm. And I, I think, I, I feel like my dogs are so lucky. And I, the dog I, that lives with me now is going to be, um, was going to be euthanized because of her behavior. And, and a huge part of it was just, she has, it's not just about energy, but she needed more freedom to actually have more self-control. She's a Husky Pomeranian cross. And uh, she is, she just stays on the farm. And, and I don't, I, I, as I mentioned to you, I've had no formal dog training. Linda used to breed uh, Great Danes. So we always had, uh, had dogs. They needed to Ha, live within the rules that was safe on the farm that that's kind of the extent of the training so they need to come when they're called they need to you know get out of the pen if they're in a pen with horses they need to uh you know what i mean they they it's just they they're just part of the family just like all families have some rules but our dogs have so much freedom and they don't take they don't leave our property we have 65 acres and it's it's not most of it's not fenced in any way that they couldn't just go through the fence and they don't. And I, dog after dog after dog, that's what my experience has been. The other dogs say to them too, hey, you know what? It's a good place here, we stay here. I think that's- I think It that's sounds like an amazing it. place. I'd probably stay there myself. Uh, <clears throat> really, <laughs> yeah. really profound there. I thought it was really, really interesting. I wrote down um, that particular dog, her truth was that she needed more freedom in order to have more more control more self-control that's really interesting <clears throat> and i think when we think about the notions of of safety and um uh you know th these kind of things that we think about we tend to think in terms of physical you know, physical safety you know being on a lead having a fence or whatever but actually emotional safety social safety is is more important actually to the individual often and, and i think definitely the case with with the animals there and I think it's important that we recognize that, as you say, boundaries are important, you know, to have those kind of rules, if you like, but they shouldn't be barriers, as in barriers to that other, in this case, the animal's ability to communicate care and support needs, because quite yeah. often the boundaries that we think of in a more compliance based model, there is no room for the dog to be able to share those care and support needs because the, the, the rules are arbitrary and they are fixed. <clears throat> yeah 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 and it's she, i mean she she's probably the most difficult dog that i had initially in that not difficult in that um because she had so little freedom she well she's a very good gopher hunter actually and we don't mind that because gophers are you know not good for horses but she we had a little bit of a problem because our neighbors have uh sheep and they have guardian dogs and their sheep and she we have a that fence is a like it's a cage wire so it's, it's a wire fence but the coyotes go underneath it and so could luna because she's only weighs 21 pounds and she, if her she's like a mouse if her head can go through her body goes through and so she was going on the other side of the fence and i'd have to go around and get it i was worried she wasn't doing any damage she just wanted to get to those gophers which they didn't mind except it wasn't so i had to go around to get her and she, these guardian dogs are lovely dogs but they're you know trained to be destructive to dogs that come on their property so what I did with her, and this is like, it was really hard to do it. People said, oh, use a shock collar and so on. I said, you know, I would, I would rehome this dog rather than use a shock collar. I, it's just not okay. So I, I kept her on a long, long lead for a long time on the harness and a long lead. And she was with us all the time because when I would let her off, she would just, boom, she would just be gone. The first time she went down the driveway to the neighbors, I got her, she came back. 
So she's on this long lead. And then I started letting her off. And I realized all she wanted to do was she'd go and explore the hay fields, but she, she never went away actually once we got her in that direction. However, she was going to the other property. So our horses eat over that fence as well. And so we have a string of electric fence along the fence. And then, so what I did with her is I, we put a lower, just a single strand of electric fence, but she was still going under it because she could. And so I put a, uh, like a pool noodle, like collar on her. She looked like a little lifesaver was attached to her harness so that she couldn't get her head actually through the fence. And I ha she wore that for about four days and then she never went through the fence again. And I felt really badly doing it, but I thought I have to keep her safe and I, I have to you know, kind of do that. And I don't blame her because we didn't happen to have gophers. They were over there and she, you know, they squeaked at her all the time. So, but anyway, that was like, I felt terrible doing it. But then I thought, well, it wasn't, I wouldn't use a shock collar. Uh, there's not a, there's not a chance that I would, that I would do that. And that was the only thing that I could really do. Um, you know? So I think coming back to the, um, <clears throat> um, uh, The but you, what you were saying before about the uh, what you're trying to look at doing with the groundwork with mm -hmm. the tea touch. Yeah. Uh, when we think about the the touches, uh, how did they come about, and how how did that specific way of doing the kind of um, the the so we, with anybody who doesn't know tea touches. I'm not an expert here at all, but they're, they're kind of circular motion and they always end with a drop. So it's kind of like a round the clock and a half a clock and come back down. Is that right? Yeah, kind of. There's a lot of variation. Like there's probably 30 different ways that we can touch them. So that started with, uh, with the Feldenkrais work, the functional integration, which is the hands-on part of the Feldenkrais work. They have numerous, just gentle movements that they do with the body. And Linda took her four years to learn it, and she thought, well, I can't teach this to people. So what she says came to her, and I think it was a little bit of a blink moment, personally. In Feldenkrais, there's lots of um, clocks, like they do a pelvic clock for an exercise, they can do a shoulder clock, and so on. And she was working with a horse, and she had just put her hands on and was just doing these little gentle movements. And the woman, the horse really calmed, and the woman said, what are you doing? And she said, I don't really know, but just put your hands on your horse and just move the tissue in a circle in a little bit and, and do that. Now, so the woman did it and she could do that and it without sliding. So you're moving the tissue rather than sliding. I think that when we have a sense of mindfulness of the contact we made, because I often say to people, when I watch some people interact with their dogs, if they did that to a person, they would be charged with assault. <laughs> and people don't mean to, but you know, you get an overly aroused dog and then people start to get overly aroused mm. and they ruffle the dogs or they pet the dogs. And I actually haven't met many dogs that, that, that don't prefer a, a slightly more mindful kind of contact. And so mm. I would say to people is it doesn't really matter like if you can just be pay more, be more aware, notice the small things that your dog does slow down a little bit. And that's having different touches. And we kind of watch people and see how do they make contact to start with? And can you give them some way to make contact that's similar, but slower and a little different? And because it's hard for us to change our habits as well. So what we noticed with all these different touches, like the, the tips of your fingers, for instance, will make this circular motion more direct. It'll make it in a smaller area. So you might use that with um, when you a horse, a dog has to get an injection or a microchip or, you, you know, some sort of area or you need to put drops in the eyes or the ears. You can just do these really, really light touches kind of around the area. If you want to be more soothing, use more of your hand. So you can use the whole of the hand, creates more warmth. So we have this whole family of circles that we do. And they've kind of expanded and expanded because some people, maybe you have arthritis in your hand. 
So it's going to be hard for you, or maybe you've done lots of deep tissue work. So you, all you know is this like quite firm contact and, and you want to be softer. Well, maybe if you use the side of your hand or the back of your hand, you'll be softer. And then we notice how does the animal respond? And, and it's really only, it's where is the starting point for the animal? You know, where is the starting point mm -hmm. that the animal goes, yeah, this, this contact is okay. So that's really important what you just said there. I think. So I think a lot of people who might have heard of T-Touch or see some of the things that are, that are talked about might be reluctant to have a go at some things because they're worried about getting it wrong or I don't know how to specifically do it. Like it's some kind of, you know, ancient art. Uh, of doing <laughs> right. But actually what you're saying there is everything's kind of okay as long as you're very present yourself and you're very mindful and you're waiting for that feedback from the animal all the time. Yeah, and it's the pause that allows an animal to give you feedback. Mm. If if we never stop, and I and 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 I mean like pause and kind of you know step away, and it's why I don't use heaps and heaps of food when I'm working with them. I will for certain things. Um, I sometimes see I, well, and, and even for touch contact, I remember I was watching this this dog, and we were I was teaching this person some touch at a evening workshop, and she was using food paired with everything that she did every touch that she did and and but I watched the dog and I thought the dog's actually not okay with what you're doing it's just doing it because you're giving it food I mean it's and and so I and and the massage therapist that this dog got massage therapy had to use food to get the dog on the mat and then use food throughout the whole thing and I so anyway I changed how she was touching and I had her just take away the food so it wasn't you know sort of distracting for the dog food's a huge powerful tool it's just that it, it can you know like everything and uh then the dog was really okay because she then paid more attention to how she touched so the dog could actually give her feedback about what was okay and that feedback's more likely to be more genuine because we can easily without meaning to create some internal conflict i think with food because mm. uh, you know, oh, i'm not really sure about this but i kind of want the food so i'll keep doing that I remember talking to Sarah uh, years ago, really, about um, how important the word relief is in, in human therapy and support, mm. uh, this notion of seeking relief, because whenever you feel uh, any physical pain or discomfort or emotional pain and discomfort, and often the two are interconnected, we seek relief. And, uh, and uh, it was Sarah who was like, really, kind of, oh, my God, that's the word, relief, relief, relief. That's what really kind of inspired me to start talking about it more, because... But this notion of relief seems very connected to what you do with T-Touch. I think on many levels, not just the physical, but also the emotional and, and dare I say, spiritual. Yeah, you know, and, and it's, we always think about balance as being physical, emotional, mental. We talked about that for uh, ever. And, you know, the spiritual aspect of it, Linda is on a very different level of spirituality than than most people that I know. And I was thinking when in one of the talks I watched you give talking about Candace Pert and in the late nineties is actually when Linda sort of heard about, um, about molecules of emotion about the book and so on. And it was, that was one of the things that kind of validated what we do because Linda talked about like cellular function and the knowledge of the cells for years and years before she there was any sort of science to back it up. And that part of it is, as you said earlier, people can get, you know, if it's not scientifically proven, then it doesn't exist. Well, things exist before they're scientifically proven, actually. And the thing about science, which is great, is that it's also about proving new things and, you know, and, and just sort of validating it. So but when she, you know, read Molecules of Motion and it said that fear is held at a cellular level and that you can help release fear through touch, not T-touch, but through touch that is not painful and not, you know, that they're not threatening. And that for Linda was just so validating for what her experience had been in seeing these animals that had expressed um, so much fear in different levels. And the other thing that really influenced Linda was the um, Course of Miracles, which in one of the things that they say is that, that the basis for most aggression comes from a place of fear. 
And, and we certainly see that in animals, don't we? The fear can be in fear of supplies, you know, losing supplies, fear of space, fear of, you know, any kind of contact. So fear can be on a diff- lot of different levels. Yeah, I think this is the thing, um, I kind of touched on it a minute ago, but I think uh, our colleagues in, in veterinary, for example, have more historically said, you know, is it pain or is it behavior? And actually, that just isn't fit for purpose now when we look at it. I talked about, I, I was lucky enough to talk at the London Vet Show uh, in November last year, and that's what I was trying to present, really, that the only, the only question we need to ask is, is this physical pain and discomfort or is it emotional pain and discomfort? And yeah. I say both are both interconnected there. And I think when we think about how much, especially for us and dogs, uh, I don't know about horses so much, but um, because we are our brains are heavily kind of uh, kind of skewed towards uh, safe social connections, you know, the need for social safety. Uh, there's a lot that goes on, especially for dogs, where that social safety is compromised a lot to their ability to be able to process safely what they need to do, social processing, mm. um, which is different, of course, to social engagement. I think a lot of dogs just have to endure a lot of social engagement that they haven't necessarily been ready for or processed. But all of these things, you know, when we think about how... Uh, actually, even now I see some things, uh, Robin, uh, which isn't very helpful, I know, but where people might poo-poo T-touch or, 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 th- or, or variants of T-touch. But actually, I think the science is, is more and more there to support it. We talked earlier about, you know, we don't have to wait for the science on everything. But when we think now about what we know about um, social threat evaluation in the brain, when we know what, about the role of trauma, when we know about the role of attachment, when we know the role of the nervous system and um, and uh, how um, you know, especially with young, the younger animals, how dysregulation plays a big part in, in their developmental aspects. All these things are very heavily related, aren't they, to T-touch? I, I would say, and what you've been talking about all these years, which is we've got to, you know, if, if that animal is constantly not being able to feel safe, not being able to communicate their yeah. need for that safety that will have an impact upon that animal's nervous system and their physiology over time. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, this ideal of feeling, idea of feeling safe is nothing new. You know, that whole hierarchy of needs, the number one need that has to be met is, is feeling safe. And I don't care. It's not just for humans, you know, it really Mm. is. Um, And, and it's something that, you know, we don't always consider or, you know, I, I always say that, I mean, horses and dogs, the thing about horses and dogs is they are the ones that we have the highest expectation of behavior for. So um, we also have a cat and, and you know, I will say to people sometimes, so imagine if your, um, you know, your cat might jump on the counter because they get food there or there's some reason and you might go, oh, bad kitty, get off. Or you might say, here's your food. If your dog jumped on the counter, we would like, you know, freak out because for all sorts of reasons. So we have this expectation even higher than for humans. You know, we expect that a dog and a horse in particular are going to be pretty much the same every day when we, you know, we give them a command to do it or we ask them to do whatever they've done yesterday and they should do it exactly the same way. Mm. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't get that. That that would be nice maybe, but I don't want a robot for an animal. And there are so many reasons that animals may not be able to comply with what we what we ask them to do, and we take it so personally. And that's the thing. I think uh, you know, uh, having spent time with Sarah, a uh, at Tilly Farm, and uh, you know, for me that was a big thing because uh, I felt that I had a connection to dogs, but Sarah gave me a, 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 an even bigger lens to look through about what yeah. that experience might be. And uh, I think. Um, we have to recognize that anything we ask of another is ultimately a request because like you say that the, the, i think the, the issue for the general public is they've been convinced that the most important thing is a well-trained obedient dog and it's not that it's not important to do training but everything becomes a, an obedience issue now whereas in fact it's the animal trying to communicate something else that is now being overlooked and and being missed and i think um uh 
and it's always trying to work out, I guess, what is the primary and what is the secondary for a lot of these animals. Again, spending time at, with Sarah Vertilli Farm, seeing the um, seeing the things that some of the things that was being shown through the free work about the animals potentially, and Sarah always talks about the question mark, you know, about the fact that the animal might be seeming a bit tense somewhere or might be holding uh, some tension in, in a certain part of their body. Yeah. Uh, all these things have a big impact, don't they, on the individual, I would think, because I know myself, uh, when I get stressed, so this is the kind of chicken and the egg thing, isn't it? But yeah. I know with myself, when I get stressed, I start to really feel it through my shoulders and my lumbar area. That then has a, a knock-on effect because I'm, I'm my own kind of posture is affected. Mm. Uh, but I have the opportunity to think, oh, actually, I need to rest or I need to change my posture or mm. I need to mm. you know, take some medication. But I'm not having a, a lead and collar put on me every day and being made to go out for walks and being told to yeah. sit down every two minutes and all these kind of things. And you can see how so many of these animals just over time, things start to get really complicated for them regarding their ability to get back to that more to go through that homeostatic process to get back to a a normalish state, you know. Yeah, or 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 it just becomes their reality, just like with people, you know. It it doesn't. It's. I mean, I think it's important that we teach our animals about resilience as well, you know. So I think it's okay to expose animals to small things, like the whole concept of the sort of Feldenkrais work is that. Um, if you have this bubble, if you're okay in this in he, right here, and if we just keep them right here, that's where they're going to stay. But if we can offer them, and this is one of the other things that the, the playground of higher learning does. So maybe they find the labyrinth a little difficult. So what can you do? Oh, you make it bigger, or you take them away from it, or you kind of do something else. Um, if you can start to step them out of their comfort zone just a wee bit and then take them back in, that is one of the that's part of the novelty of being able to kind of create more resilience because we we kind of have a I, I feel like we have a, a responsibility to our animals to help them be as resilient as possible god forbid something should happen to you or me and our animals had to go and live somewhere else and and i i don't think that that's just about training you know i think that is about um I think that's about a building a relationship but having them be comfortable in their own bodies so that when you um, you know that you can touch them all over not in a way because I've desensitized them to they have to put up with it but that they're actually comfortable with it I think that makes a huge difference to because we're looking to help animals learn how to learn and and that's is so that when rather than a, an education of training, but learn how, how can they, can they learn how to, how to learn? And, and I, and this, and the same thing with people. And I, I think that's uh, something that we've always really focused on the same thing with the horses. You know, we give them, go through this playground, we give them these tools, and then you can train them to do a lot of other things because they've learned how to learn. I love that. Learn how to learn. And, and I think, uh, you yeah, know, um, there is a big difference between what we're taught and what we learn, you know, I, I, on a very fundamental basis. And, and as, as a species, we're very kind of biased towards structured learning. That's why we put kids through school and go to dog training classes. But actually, Mother Nature, from another major point of view, it is that notion of experiential learning and, and feeling safe to be able to learn. And especially when you're younger, to be able to um, be in a more dysregulated state, but still feel safe and have those safe anchors. That's very important because it gives confidence then to be able to self-regulate better when you're older. And I, and I guess mm. some of the things you've said earlier on, um, when we think, because we talk, we're talking a lot more about self-regulation now and what that is, and 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 the mechanics that need to be there, both neurologically and physiologically. But going back to sort of Candace Pert's work, really, if we don't have that free-flowing system and we get those blocks, those kind of neurochemical blocks that can build up, then actually the, just, the, just the actual act of self-regulation becomes harder. Mm. You know, I see this a lot with um, dogs who have gone on to have diagnoses, especially neuropathic issues. Um, I've got an amazing physio that I work with, Kate Davey. I'll be lost without her, Robin, to be honest, I think. Uh, she's amazing and, and um, she picks up on a lot of stuff. Uh, and, um, uh, you can see why that dog really struggles to settle until that release has come, that relief has come. 
then they can find that normal kind of elevation decompression pattern. And that's an important um, thing for a lot of these animals, I think, that we see as being problematic or challenging. Uh, and you found that with your dog, obviously, that came to you. You know, that dog just needed more freedom. It wasn't a case of doing loads of training. It was a case of that dog being able to have those kind of natural outlets to allow yeah. some of that decompression to happen for themselves. And the sniffing, you know, like, because we have, <clears throat> I think that, you know, and, and I, I had a, actually a, a friend who got a, she had a standard poodle who had lots of issues as a puppy and, and because of COVID and, you know, there were lots of things, didn't have enough, you know, exposure to different situations. So she brought her out here because Luna would, would play with her. But what we ended up doing was actually just going for walks in our field. And because uh, while Luna will play with another dog, she doesn't like hard play. She doesn't do anything. She'll meet that dog, but they did lots of sniffing, lots of sniffing. And, mm. and it, you know, that, that freedom to explore their environment, a very natural environment is, it is, was so helpful. And I, and it's just even the whole thing of sniffing. I mean, you know, there's still people that take their dogs for their walk and they don't want them to sniff It's because it's inconvenient at the time, but you know, we know, we know there's so much research about the importance of allowing dogs to have that. Um, the, the walk is for the dog, as far as I'm concerned. And so mm -hmm. being able to, and you know, do their pee mail and all that kind of stuff when they're walking along, I think is, is, is so, so important. Yeah, and I think this is the, this is a common theme, isn't it? I think on a lot of the mm -hmm. different threads of, of things that we're talking about, um, with this kind of, as I say, new and in inverted commas narrative, it's not new, but uh, which is about kind of slowing down and giving the dog the opportunity to process and to giving the dog opportunity to engage with the environment in a way that they feel they need to, predominantly to feel safe, I guess, and also to kind of process well. And for us to be better at observing that for them, because we bring a lot of preconceived ideas, don't we, about what a dog is and what a dog needs and how a dog should be and we talked about this at the top of the hour really about how perception is everything of mm. course and I think that's another powerful thing from T-Touch for a lot of the people that I know who have uh, either gone on to learn it or have experienced it by being um, uh, you know a client of somebody who does the T-Touch is almost seeing a different animal in front of them because it, it provides a new way to to connect in that way. Yeah and it is about seeing an animal for their greatest potential. I mean, that, you know, that's the other, and, and also their person, because we have to recognize that the human end of that is probably doing the best they can. Like, you know, they probably have also some notions about how a dog should be, you know, how a dog should be kept and what they should do. And if you've been raised with that, that's just like your whole life philosophy sometimes. So you have to be sometimes kind of gentle to help them come to the realization uh, of seeing their dog through through a different way because we know all of the you know labels that can get put on <clears throat> dogs and people that are so limiting in terms of you know the potential because you know how how someone sees you or me in one situation they might see us very differently in a, in another situation and I I think that that's something that's um, is challenging and <clears throat> one of the things that I <clears throat> have taken from Apparently, there was an Alexander teacher that he came up with this concept of 75-25. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but he realized that when he paid 75% of the attention to what he was doing with his own body, with his posture, with his thoughts and so on, while he was giving a lesson to someone, and only 25% to them, they had a better lesson. And so what I will say to people is take that into everything that you do pay 75% of the attention if you're having a conversation with someone. It's only you can, the only thing you have the potential to control in this world is yourself. So, and you have the potential to change yourself, which will change what happens with your dog, your horse, whatever. So I said, always, you know, pay attention. Sometimes it's more like 90, 10, you know, pay 90% of the attention to what you're doing. And if something isn't working, change something about what you're doing. And I don't mean like even big, but really change something in you. And it could be your thoughts. Mm. I think that's the important um, point, isn't it? Because um, part of our job really is as behaviorists or trainers when we step in to support others 
is supporting that caregiver owner to to um, look at some of their own expectations, not just of their dog, but the, the ones they put on themselves, which are often fueled by and weighted down by their mm. perceived, assumed judgments of others. Absolutely. Absolutely. So actually, when we when we work in this way, I think uh, yes, they say we all do things in, in different ways. I I know, but um, I think the common theme here is us trying to. Like, we talk about this at the top of the hour again. This this notion of trying to support and invite a better connection with the animal, staying humble in that process. Because again, we talked off air about the fact that you know there is no such thing as horses and dogs. You know, there is a lot that we can say about them as groups. But that individual dog, that individual horse will have a very unique story. And, uh, and that, that's what we have to be more available to. Just by going through that process, I think, Robin, it's quite humbling, even for the caregiver, actually. And uh, so many of my clients have fed back that they've learned a lot about themselves during that process. Mm. And actually, just about how much of a runaway train a lot of our lives are now and how that quick thinking brain, which makes those quick thinking judgments um, and actions, which okay, it's efficient, but feelings aren't always facts, as they say, you know, uh, especially for us, because we just tend to work on that kind of thing. And it's, and it's good to slow down sometimes and actually take stock and see what it is that we're seeing in front of us, not just what we've already pre-described to them. Yeah, a a absolutely. And I, it just made me think about years and years ago, I was teaching a five-day horse workshop and I had a, she was a well-published um, psychologist and she said to me at the end of five days, she said, you know, I've learned more about myself in five days than I learned in 20 years of therapy. And it was really about how she responded to things that were happening, whether it was with a, a, the horse or another person or whatever it happened to be. And, and, and so I, one of the things that I, I love about this work is that people often find things to themselves like it's not about it's not up to any of us to tell someone what they should or shouldn't do we can only kind of offer them possibility so that's all we can do and and it's um it's just it's so interesting how i have so many people that will say to me and i don't push this at all they'll go oh wow i, I have learned so much about myself i didn't realize this self-realization is so much more useful than having someone tell you something you know it's like who wants to be told something that they probably know deep down inside or maybe they don't actually i think sometimes we can learn those lessons through the stories and exploration of others especially animals yeah. uh, so i was working with i do a little bit of kind of community work uh, locally to here and, and um going back a little while i worked with a group of young uh, vulnerable adults and uh, one of them was a young man who'd had a lot of trauma in his life and didn't say much and struggled with his temper really he had a bit of an anger thing going on and uh, I was talking about the dogs that were there it was all done in, in, in conjunction with the local rescue and I used a good old bucket analogy because it's a good one right and he just said out of the blue he said you know what I think my bucket gets a bit too full sometimes and the key worker he was with, she got really emotional. She said, well, that was the mm. most profound thing he'd ever said. Yeah. He saw it in that moment when we were talking about dogs and why sometimes dogs might do things that, you know, in the spur of the moment when that bucket's a bit too full, because we can all do that. So I think it's powerful, Robin, and I think it can help us because there's a lot of things that come along with uh, our societal, the societal expectations, which that's a different story. I'm not saying we shouldn't have those, but a lot of us are kind of forced into a conformist model regarding various outlooks and and it can be quite liberating sometimes to say wow actually i can see things differently and i can mm. allow that care side of things to come in yeah. so what what do you think is next then for because as we talked a little bit a bit earlier about how teach has kind of evolved over time and uh, you know like say 40 50 mm. years in the making really where, where do you see the future here what what is um you know if you had your little robin <laughs> uh, you know, uh, crystal ball. Oh, good question. I, you know, it's it, it is interesting. COVID was, I know, difficult for so many people on so many levels. For me, it meant instead of traveling five months out of the year for the last thirty years, I was home, and so I had a chance to take. We took a lot of stuff online, and I, I really, I think that. For me, the, the idea would be teaching people partially online and then partially kind of in person, 
because it's so much there's a lot there's a lot of advantages of it and we didn't really know if we can teach it so I think it'll just be continuing to do that I won't travel nearly as much I just got back from Australia um, I'm going to go to Europe in uh, in the fall I might go to South Africa but nothing like I did before uh, I love actually connecting with people through Zoom and we've had amazing, we just did not know if it could work. We have an amazing um, student in India who is just, she'll, she'd never have the possibility. And so my aim is that to be able to get this out to as many people that want to learn any little part of it, because the reality is you can, even if what you do is just change something about, about like anything about what you do, change a little bit of your mind. We have this saying, change your mind, change your dog, you know, change the labels we put on the dog, change some little thing of how you do something. It doesn't have to be exactly how we would do it, but that can make such a huge difference to, uh, to animals and to people. And it's, you know, it's really, um, I, that's kind of where I see, Linda doesn't want to travel very much. She'll travel for shorter periods of time now and, and do, um, and have more people out there doing it you know and just having people recognize uh, the potential of how they can also help themselves and that one of the things that when you were talking about the you know working with the um in the community linda used to uh go to south africa and one of the things that she taught she went to soweto and some of the aids orphans she taught them the heart hug you know which is basically just you know putting your hand on your chest and taking a breath and moving the tissue in a circle and a quarter with a little pause. And what it did for them is it gave them something that they could do to help themselves. The same thing with things like, you know, the ear tea touch when you're feeling sick or you're feeling really unwell, just like stroking your ears carefully can make such a difference. If you're feeling really emotional, doing some touch around your mouth, like for the, you know, when you're people get really overwrought that can actually help and it's there's a physiological thing that's changing and uh, so I also I think that one of the challenges with t-touch is being most methods of body work on animals have come from people and this has gone the other way so people mm -hmm. didn't know what it felt like but when we have people actually feel like how you can do touches on yourself and have a huge impact and, uh, and then they realize that this seemingly innocuous looking thing that we're doing can have a huge impact. And that's a really nice kind of bring us full circle really, because you said um, at the top of the hour that Linda really wanted to make sure that whatever it is that was done, people could do it themselves. And that's the ultimate version of that because you can do it on yourself. You can you can yeah. apply it to yourself. And this is where we we share so much with dogs, horses, any other kind of mammal, really. I guess uh, maybe all animals. I don't know, but mammals especially. You know, the need to feel safe, the need for relief, um, the need to you know uh, be able to uh, feel settled and uh, and connected. All these kind of things are just really important parts of, of who we are really and and sadly when we think about modern society especially here in the UK and I guess in, in the US how much we pulled away from that uh, it's interesting because I've, I've got a human therapy background <clears throat> and uh, people have, have said well, it must have been easy working with humans because obviously they can speak to you and, and everything else but <laughs> you know what? actually humans are so much harder and it's a shame Robin and we've got to this point that even with our huge intelligence and our ability to talk <clears throat> and all the structures that we have that we find it so hard to communicate and identify emotional need. It's, it's, and whereas with an animal, if you give them yeah. the time and you alluded to this earlier, they will tell you what you need to know. <clears throat> we just have yeah. to be open, open to it. Um, yeah. So when you come out to Europe, are you coming to the UK at all? Or are you going, is it Germany? Or? Uh, Germany and Austria at this point, I really don't want to be away for more than kind of two weeks at a time. I love being home. <laughs> it's like yeah, we have well, seasons yeah. and, you know, it's really, so I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe at some point, I'm not sure. Well, there's some amazing comments in the, in the group, um, uh, Robin, so please have a look through, through those. <clears throat> and uh, where's the best place for people to find out more about T-Touch and uh, to maybe start their T-Touch journey? Our website um we have a plat a learning online learning platform which is um learn.ttouch.ca um and 
it's so there we have a lot of courses in it and i will um I, i'll make a, a discount coupon that I'll, I'll put on your thing so if anybody that's okay. watching this or whatever if they use um thankful 20 they'll get a 20 percent discount on any of our courses and uh it's because I say we just we want people to learn the work and there are lots of really brilliant people out there that are, are sharing it with people and using it in in so many different ways and you know if something's even a stepping stone for someone I, I, I love that you know because you know you can always make something better and none of us know everything. And, you know, the, the moment that you think you know something, you know, especially working with animals, they're gonna, something's going to come along that go, oh, oops, you know, yeah. there goes there goes that knowingness that we have. And and do your best to be kind, you know, to the people as well as animals. And that's not always easy because as we talked about, you're not we're not always kind to ourselves. Well, that's very true. And I, and I think they're good sentiments uh, to kind of finish up on, really, especially this notion of staying humble, because I think as, as long as we stay connected to learning, and bear in mind, we only know a fraction of what the human experience is. And in fact, yeah. uh, the only human experience we can really validate for is our own. Uh, and uh, and even that's hard sometimes. So the more we stay humble, the more we stay connected, it kind of keeps you humble, right, Robin? Because like you say, you know, um, oh, yeah. Milo, who was my dog, uh, that really made me have to face up that maybe everything I thought I knew I had to forget and start over with because he was like telling me that. Uh, it, it is very humbling. Well, it's been amazing, Robbie. said it's been amazing uh, comments um, in the in the groups. A lot of people have been really inspired to to learn more. Thank you so much for that generous uh, for the discount. So I'll I'll speak to you off air in a moment, and we can okay. make sure we put everything in there. Um, so great, what a great way to start the the year, everybody. Uh, our next chat is with um, Annie Phoenix. Next Friday, Friday the 13th. What could go wrong, Robin? Uh, Friday, Friday, me, me and Annie Phoenix, we're going to set the world to rights. Uh, so, and also what I've started to do now is uh, if you've enjoyed the conversation today and uh, you feel you want to um, uh, contribute something to a local rescue, I'm going to be picking a, a local, uh, not local, I'm be picking a rescue each month. Nice. Uh, and because I've had people contact me, Robin, about, um, you know, offering financial thanks to things which is all very nice but I think this is a great way to do things so the one this month is Rotty Friends Rescue up in Somerset mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be sharing that during the course of the month the link and we've got the wonderful Angela Curtis who runs that rescue uh, she's going to come into the group on the 19th for a chat like this and she's going to talk to us about Rottweilers uh, and uh, Angela's doing amazing things Robin because she is not only providing a safe haven for this wonderful uh, breed of dog but also she is doing a lot to educate others about the kind of uh, supporting them in, in a more kind and humane way because sadly it's a breed that is yeah. especially since the omen films and all that kind of thing it's been there yeah. so there's a chance to hear Angela and she'll also be talking about rescue as well so that's going to be there for that uh great well wonderful thank you so much Robin for tonight I really appreciate it thank you it was I really enjoyed our conversation yeah, yeah me too very much. We'll have to have you back again. I think there's a lot of things, now that we've introduced some things, I think there's a lot of things we could kind of look into again. But thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for tuning in. And I'll see you next Friday, hopefully, uh, with Annie Phoenix. Uh, thanks, Robin. Thank you.